Welcome to Talent Hub Talk. I am Ben Duncan, and this is a place where prominent and inspirational figures from both the local ANZ and global Salesforce Ohana share their stories. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Flow Republic. Flow Republic is the elite Salesforce Academy, helping architects all over the world to realize their goal of becoming a Salesforce certified technical architect. The success that architects are having with Flow Republic is incredible. So if you are on your journey to CTA, then I highly recommend checking out flowrepublic.com to understand how they can help you. In today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Martin Viskachil, a Salesforce CTA and associate partner at IBM in the UK. Martin talks us through his early career, how he did not come from an IT background initially, and explains how working in different sales support manager roles has actually benefited him in his Salesforce career. Martin explains how he first came to work in IT, why he felt the company gave him the opportunity to take on a leadership role at the time, and what he first made of Salesforce when his company moved to the platform from Oracle. Having spent a number of years with one company, Martin shares what attracted him into the consulting space and how working for Salesforce compared to working with more recent Salesforce partners. Finally, Martin opens up on his CTA journey, how it played out, and how he tackled health and scheduling challenges along the way, leading him to be in review board preparation mode for a considerable period of time, what this meant for his mental health, what it felt like to finally pass, and goals that are important to him now. I hope you enjoy the episode, and if you do, please do subscribe for future episodes that are coming through. Martin, thank you for joining us. Hi, Ben. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure is all mine. So um, I've had a lot of your friends on the podcast in the past, people that you've uh, you've been on the, the CTA journey with. So I'm, I'm really excited to to unpick your journey and hear more about your story. Um, so for for the benefit of uh, of people listening um, who might not have spoken to you or, or worked with you in the past, we're going to go a bit of, of your background before we get into the Salesforce stuff. So can you tell me a bit about your career before Salesforce and um, and the path you were following? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as you refer to my friends, it kind of like uh, felt almost mandatory for me to join this show because uh, a lot of the study buddies, they, they did the same after completing the CTA journey. So I was like, yeah, I must be here as well. So to the question, right? So about my uh, journey before uh, joining Salesforce career. Um, so surprisingly, I didn't come from technical background at all. I um, I didn't study computer science or I didn't play with computers or didn't spend much time behind computers at all. I was mostly uh, coming from a business background. So at uni, I studied management and economics, which is a completely non-technical subject. I didn't know about my techno uh, interest in technology at all, but uh, at uni, there was one subject called operational management, which was very much focused on critical thinking, and I excelled at that. So that could have been a, a precursor potentially for my architect career later on. Yeah. So um, when you finished then uni, when you went into the workforce, what kind of roles did you, uh, what, what were you looking to do, I guess, at that point? What was your, your passion or your, your driver behind the, the kind of roles that you were looking to, to explore? Well, to be fair, I didn't really know uh, exactly what was going to be the, uh, the journey for me. Um, at uni, I was part of a student's organization called Isaac, um, and uh, we organized um, students' internships uh, all around the world. And I was very active. I uh, actually even joined management of that organization at that point, and I felt like I should go on an internship myself. However, straight after uni, uh, uni I, I got a job uh, at a huge automotive company back in Czech Republic. And um, whilst I was quite successful in that role, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy the uh, the basically the, the dynamics and uh, the the type of role I had. So I left very soon after. I only spent there seven months, and then I was lucky enough to got accepted for an internship in the UK. I, I joined a company called Sara Lee. Nowadays, they are owned by Unilever. And uh, there I uh, started a role as a sales analyst. Not working in sales per se, but analyzing, helping sales um, with, you know, planning and um, I guess analyzing best better ways of working and making recommendations, things like that. Precisely. That's, that's exactly that. It was uh, supporting uh, key account managers and uh, it was the environment was about retail execution and um Mostly, uh, we were 
doing big promotions, uh, selling like uh, fast moving goods in uh, in big retailers like Tesco or Sainsbury's, and running promotions there to, to to make the sales successful. So I was more supporting the administrative side of things. Yeah. So at what point did um, did technology kind of um, become an interest? It was exactly at that point in, in Sarah Lee where as uh, we were analyzing the certain data, certain metrics like uh, sales, uh, like actual sales versus plan versus target, I was pre- preparing a lot of these reports. Uh, and um, at one point, I actually built a kind of very dynamic advanced dashboard in Excel for for the whole business. And uh, later on, I was awarded employee of the quarter for that. And um, I realized I might I might have some um, uh, technical skills at that point because uh, until then I didn't know and I was completely like self learning everything, googling like how to do tips and tricks in in Excel, and uh, yeah, um, that was probably the, the the first technical part of my career. And, and I know you went into like a sales support manager um, position. Like if you look back now and, and look at kind of what you learned about the sales team and, and understanding, you know, how sales work um, or sales teams work, I guess, and, and understanding, you know, what their goals are and, and how technology can enable them. Do you do you look back and think of that role as, um, as being kind of uh, like a, a useful step in your career into the Salesforce world? Yeah, absolutely. Because that really allowed me to uh, to step into the shoes of the of the sales reps and key account managers and even the the senior sales executives. Uh, so I understood what their needs were, the sort of uh, the tools that would help them to be more productive in their role, and the the importance of certain information, how it's presented, the user experience, and everything like that. And then you uh, you went into a role with uh, a company called Elevon, I saw as a BA. So was that? Um, obviously a business analyst, but working on technology projects, was that like your, your first step into a technology role? Yeah, in, in a way. Uh, I actually, uh, when I joined Elevon, it was um, my first role there was uh, as a compensation analyst, but there was a very short stunt in there. So um, I very soon uh, moved into a new role, uh, which was uh, a, a CRM manager. And the way that happened was that actually at that point, we were just transitioning from uh, Siebel CRM to Oracle Fusion. And my boss at the time, he was leading the whole implementation. However, he left. And uh, we were st- still kind of needing to implement it. And we had a CRM manager already back then, but it was very overwhelming for, for her to actually lead the whole implementation. So. I started to help out. I started to, to contribute on top of my um, comp- compensation analyst job. And um, in about two months, I helped out to build uh, approximately 200 reports and dashboards. And um, then we got a new boss and he clearly saw that I had the technical skills and I knew how to actually manage the whole system. And he, um, he then nominated me to be the, the Sierra manager instead. And and you you took on like you were a technical lead role as well in the same organization, right? Over time, you eventually took on that that role of technical lead. To what what do you think they saw in you to to give you that responsibility? Seeing as you you hadn't necessarily come from a technical background. Indeed, I think um, yeah, the the role actually grew over time because we uh, we started with the European implementation for about two hundred people, uh, two hundred users, but. Uh, as we keep growing, we grew to 500. Then uh, I needed a team around me, so I, I then hire a BA uh, admin and developer, and um, yeah, so I just became the the, the overall technical owner. But to answer the question, what did they see in me? I think it was mostly a a trust they they had in uh, in me as a person that I was very committed to overcome the big obstacles we had with uh, with Fusion and, and Siebel as well, and um, my technical abilities. And yeah, I, I, I had a lot of trust from, from my boss back then. So I think that was the main reason. And at that point, obviously, having not studied technology and not, like you said, you didn't go through a computer science degree or anything like that, did you, did you have to invest in yourself at that point to become more technical? Absolutely, massively. I actually, I remember in the early days, I was like 
completely obsessed by by learning about about CRM. I was like studying past midnight often and spending even weekends. So I was like, in the, the first year, I was just completely absorbed in that. That would have set you up nicely for what was to come with your CTA uh, studies as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a similar intensity probably, yeah. <laughs> so you you initially were working with Oracle, and I know the business transitioned to Salesforce. Um, was it immediate to you um, at that point, the power of Salesforce? Like, was it? Did you see the, the value in, in that transition immediately? Absolutely, big time. There were immediate benefits uh, that the, the users appreciated. To start with, uh, Salesforce was very stable comparatively to Oracle. It's just work, right? Because um, the overall experience was much better. It was um, pretty pretty smooth and fast. And the users were really amazed, like how quickly we were able to to churn new new features and enhancements for them, right? But for me, the huge difference was also in the fact that how easy it was to to learn Salesforce and uh, to find a documentation. You know, by then Trailhead was already available. And um, we now take it for granted, but uh, I couldn't find any proper documentation uh, for for Oracle. I, I was lucky enough if I found a, a YouTube video or something, but for me it was still not enough information to learn, like how to how to code or uh, yeah how to configure the system. So it was um, much harder work for me to to add, to be the admin or let's say the the technical resource for for Oracle versus Salesforce. And did you become, did you, like when you, you say to code, like did you become a developer as well in the Salesforce ecosystem or were you coding or have you always stayed on the, the more functional side? Yeah, so initially I was uh, pretty much the, the single resource. So I was uh, wearing all the hats, right? So I was, uh, yeah, I was coding, I was configuring, uh, being the BA. Like I, I remember I written my first trigger after two months, uh, and then that, that went in production. I then had to wow. refactor it, <laughs> admittedly, <laughs> to, 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 to bulkify it and all of that. But uh, yeah, um, that's why my, my uh, learning curve was uh, so steep, because I had the opportunity to be everything, and I didn't have to go through long approval process uh, or long communication chains to, to get something done. Mm-hmm. And and you um, soon after you were working in consulting, so you joined Salesforce as your first kind of step into that consulting world. Was, was that on the professional services side? Indeed, it was. Yeah. So, what was it that made you want to go into consulting, and and how did sales working for Salesforce compare to what you thought it would be? Okay, so the first question: What uh, made me want to go to consulting? Um, so after six and a half years working for for the end customer, it uh, was it was very interesting experience and useful experience. I felt like it was becoming a little bit um, monotonous. Like it didn't have a clear path for me to to follow further, and there was no obvious grow either. Right. Uh, so I felt like I probably exhausted the potential of the role, um, and uh, I probably even could have left a bit earlier. To be fair, and. Also, I was, pre- I knew I was already pretty much doing the role of an architect, but I was not officially recognized for that. So I thought, actually, it's probably a good time for me to to look around. So that's for one. Uh, second, uh, also, I wanted to expand my horizons a little bit and uh, try different Salesforce products. Even though we already, I was responsible for the sales cloud of things, but we also had service cloud and marketing. But those uh, were run by different teams, so I did not have as much contact with that technology. And I wanted to also uh, expand to different um, industries too. Uh, so that that was the main driver. Yeah, like a lot of people were actually warning me uh, about consulting that it could be very draining and uh, don't do that and it's not for me. But uh, I, I didn't listen to, to those voices. And in fact, uh, it was not as, as bad as, as they said. I, I actually found that my work-life balance is, is better in consulting because even though it's right, it could be pretty intense at times, but I think it more comes in waves. Right? Like usually when there are either deadlines for implementation or deadlines for RFPs, yes, it's intense. But once you deliver that, then there's usually a bit of time to recover to get ready for the next gig, right? Whereas, like uh, the role I was in uh, in the end customer, that was pretty much constant, right? And because I was there from the beginning, like I kind of 
inherited all the possible problems. Everything was like landing on my desk, uh, which, yeah, that, that was also even more draining, I would say. So yeah, move to consulting was definitely the, the right choice. And I would say from that moment, uh, my my career really started to, to fly high uh, because yeah, so many so many different opportunities, easy access to to to, uh, to certificates and uh, to learning overall and, and to learn from uh, more experienced colleagues. So yeah, um, I think uh, move to consulting was the right one. And, uh, and and joining Salesforce now, you've gone on to work for other partners as well, like other consulting firms. Do, does, is it similar working for Salesforce in in the professional services space? Is it is it the same as working for you know an IBM or a PwC? Yeah, I, I just realized I, I forgot to answer your second part of the question. Right? Like, how was it to join Salesforce? I think it was um, well for me. It was like dream coming true, right? So joining uh, the mothership, uh, experiencing the Ohana culture, it was uh, it, it was truly amazing. I I loved working at Salesforce. That's for first. Now. How different it is to uh, to PwC or or IBM? I think actually it's uh, not that different. I think they are all great companies, uh, very well established. They have great values. They they look after their employees. They uh, they uh, they invest into uh, education and learning. And I think. Uh, if you work in professional services, it, your employee experience is very much driven by by the projects you are on, right? So and. There you are quite a, a lot in charge because you could actually establish the relationships with your uh, teammates and with your with with, uh, with the customer as well, right? So I must say I've been mostly fortunate to have uh, very nice projects. Um, so um, my experience across all these three companies was quite similar, I would say, uh, in terms of how these companies operate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So, uh, tell me a bit about when when the CTA became a goal of yours, like how how that came about, and then also like what that journey has looked like for you. Yeah, so that uh, that first thought started uh, when I was at Salesforce because um, at, at Salesforce, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, people usually get a ramp up period, which is a very nice bonus, right? So my my ramp up period took six weeks. So in that time. You are not uh, assigned to any project. You have just time to get to know the company, get to know the, the processes, colleagues, and also uh, catch up with uh, with certifications, right? So I tackled a big part of the uh, the, the CTA pyramid, if you like, uh, in, in that period. And uh, also, um, I had two teammates uh, who, who were already on the journey. And Mike Murphy, uh, he then... Um, he didn't achieve CTA and it was like celebrated as a big achievement uh, on the team. So my manager back then, he really encouraged us like to, to follow the same path. And uh, so, yeah, I, I started to think about it actively. I could see that there were a lot of CTAs in, in Salesforce. So I, I thought like, yeah, that's actually accessible for me. I started to follow the path. However, in uh, in Salesforce, the, the path for the internal candidates is a bit more stringent because they first have to qualify by earning uh, nine bedrock badges. So those are domain-specific scenarios which you have to uh, design and solve for, but you also have to build the solution, and then you present it to a CTA judge. So it's it's a very nice thorough process which really gets you ready, but it's also very time-consuming. So it took me a while to work through it, and um, I earned four bedrock badges, but by then, I was actually uh, joining PwC already, so I never really fully qualified for, for that. But fortunately, uh, very soon after I joined PwC, I was able to to join an official coaching program with uh, Flow Republic. Right? And I think that's where the game started to be really serious for me, because before that, I had no idea about how to structure CT presentation, um, what to even write down for the solution, how to how to present it uh, in um, in the right format, and how to handle Q and A, right? So, all of these things uh, I learned at um, at Flow Republic, and I also uh, got to know my uh, my study buddies back there, and that was super important because we were literally meeting up on a daily basis, and um, there I, I could feel like how quickly I, I was uh, improving uh, pretty much uh, every week. So. My journey uh, there was uh, very good. I, I felt very positive, and uh, I I think I was like ahead of everybody else initially. 
uh, I was ahead of the plan. And uh, so that was in, so we started in February, 2021. And by July, I was already taking the evaluation board, which you probably know that's the, and nowadays that's the prerequisite. If you want to sit the full review board, you have to pass evaluation board first. So I did that successfully in July, and then I was offered a date for, for the full review board in, uh, in October. And I felt really good about it. I was getting ready. And then uh, my colleague in PwC, he was also on the CTA journey, and we were on the same project, and he was the lead architect, and he needed to take some time off. So I was actually uh, temporarily taking his role as the lead architect, and it was a very big and demanding project which uh, meant that uh, as a result, I was actually not able to fully prepare for my board in October and I had to postpone till November. And unfortunately what happened just a week before, uh, the whole family got very sick with COVID, right? And it was not the mild COVID, it was the, the full blown version of COVID, if you like, with a uh, high fever for four days and all that. So it was a tough decision, right, whether to go for the board or, or not. Uh, but uh, with my coach uh, back then, uh, we decided to, to try because we knew that uh, if um, what was the consequence if I if I couldn't go, then I would have to wait for another date. So we we said, okay, let's try that anyway. And um, yeah, I think it was it was a wasted effort because. Um, I couldn't think clearly, or I was not as sharp. I was still like very tired and uh, I only managed to pass one section out of seven, right? So um, nevertheless, I, at least I got to, to to be familiar with the whole process and uh, I, I hope I, I got some learnings from that. But then I had to continue my journey and I got another date for, uh, for retake uh, in, in February, 2022. But what happened was also, I, I again, I changed company. I, I joined IBM by the time, and that meant I had to reapply for, for my slot again. Um, so that delayed my process for a few months again. Uh, my next slot was then in May. And um, what happened was that we had a family wedding <laughs> exactly that week. Um, so it was a big dilemma. It was a very hard moment for me to, to decide what to do. But I followed my instinct and I decided not to accept that slot and I went for the wedding instead because I felt like my family just would not forgive me if I if I didn't turn up because of my my uh, exam, right? Uh, I don't think anybody really understood in the family like what CITE is about. It's hard to explain to them. So I postponed my, uh, my date and uh, the next slot was only in October. So... If you do the math, uh, from November 21 to October 22, it was almost 12 months. And so that's a very long time, right, between between the attempts. And I had to keep myself uh, fresh. I was, like, constantly trying to, to peak my performance, which was, like, totally draining. But uh, eventually, I, I managed to have my second attempt, and it was quite a successful one because I passed six out of seven selections which I thought that that was very positive result for me. I knew I was already in touching distance. I only needed to do one more section to, to finish it off. So yeah, I, that, that was a huge boost. And then indeed in, in uh, January 23, I, um, I finally smashed it. The, the, the last of them was probably my best. And yeah, that, that went nicely. And I finally earned my prize, which was a huge relief, not just for me, but for, for the whole family as well. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And what, what, what is that feeling like having, cause you, your journey, you know, there were plenty of ups and downs along that way. What was the feeling like when you got the, the email or the, the response saying that you'd, you'd passed? Yeah, the feeling is, is amazing. I remember I was actually, uh, walking outside, uh, by, by the river and I was on a client's call and, um, I just got to know that email uh, and, um, I felt like I, I I wanted to scream and shout like out of happiness, but I couldn't because I was on a call. Uh, but I was just like quietly shouting and jumping. So yeah, it, it, it's it's amazing emotion really to to experience that. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we've touched on the highs and lows of that um, that journey. Obviously, COVID, then like the the wedding, which I'm sure was a great wedding, but meant that you couldn't do the the review board, and then you know the partial pass and. 
Um, I know that you were um, at the time also in touch with Sam Woodwani at the beginning of your journey, and he would ask you questions around like, how you're feeling, not just like about the, the the review board itself, but in yourself and the preparation and mental health. And at the time, did you understand why that was so important? Yeah, you're right with that, because uh, when I was at PwC, Sam was always trying to make sure uh, that the CTA candidates, they had a good mental health and they were dealing with with the pressure on top of their daily jobs. Right? And I I had quite a good journey until that point, so I did not really understand the, the reasoning behind why was Sam uh, checking so much, but it became apparent for me later on, because... In the second year of the journey, uh, because it was so long and so draining, then I realized the the mental health aspect, how how important it was, right? So yeah, uh, in in terms of the ups and downs, um, I I think um, probably the the biggest lows for me were in in the summer, right? After the wedding, when uh, I actually realized I became quite frustrated um, with the whole process and trying to handle the challenges of the scheduling process with live events uh, that some of them were out of my control and just to to make it all happen, right? And whilst keeping myself uh, in in peak performance, right? Um, So what I actually did in the summer was I took my head off CTA a little bit and I just focused on some other certs just to, I knew I needed to channel the energy so I earned nine accredited professionals in the time and two Salesforce uh, um, uh, certifications. So I, I think like I was probably like a little kid needing a bit of dopamine, uh, some some reward because you know I- imagine you are investing so much energy and effort in the CTA and there is still no reward until you actually earn something, right? So I just needed to, to get some reward from something different, right? So. Um, so that was for one, and then I know um, when I first my, uh, when I filmed my first attempt, um, I spoke to my coach from Florida Republic, Johan, uh, and he told me just Martin, give it another four or five hundred hours, and you will be you will be positively surprised with the result, right? Because I I didn't know like what to, what to study differently or how to prepare differently, but Johan just said like just do it and you will see, and, and yeah, he was right. It was like uh, I I completely then changed my uh, approach. I was studying for for different things that are not just knowledge. I was preparing more for for soft skills and how to handle the Q and A, time management, and all that. Right. And I would also say um, when I joined IBM, uh, I was very fortunate because uh, I was assigned Jitan Raza as, as the coach, and uh, Jitan Raza was incredibly committed. Like he was literally getting up every Saturday and Sunday early morning just to give up parts of his weekend to coach us and seeing him so committed and how much he was prepared to to give up for, for us. Um, there was literally no excuse for me, right? Just to say, well, I'm I'm giving up now. I'm not doing it anymore. No, like I had a, I had such an amazing coach, so, so committed. I had to do it, right? There was no excuse. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Like the 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 time people do give up to help others on their journey. Yeah. Like I've I've seen that as a, a theme and a trend throughout the conversations I've had, and it is it's crazy. And Jatendra's name has come up uh, obviously numerous times, and again he's been a guest on the podcast. So it's great to to know that he was helpful. Um, in in that journey though, um, obviously like you, I, I guess someone that hasn't done the review board or hasn't hasn't attempted it and hasn't prepared for it, they might not really appreciate. Um, just how much you have to be on through that period, right? And that's where the, the mental health challenge comes from because, like you said, you wanted to stay in peak performance zone. Um, so, like, it, it, how many days off, apart from the, the summer break um, where you, you studied on, uh, focused on the certs, like how many days off were you having a week in terms of not studying for, for certs in the time that you were really kind of going for it? Well, there were very few days when I was not actually studying because... Um, I just couldn't get my mind completely switched off, right? And I think that was the problem why it was so draining. Um, I remember we even went to vacation on, uh, to Spain, and uh, even there I was like still reading uh, Salesforce books and still kind of like resting, but not completely. Like, <laughs> so would you do any, if you could go back to the beginning of your journey now, would you do anything differently? It's a great question, right? Uh, 
I, I think it also depends on the perspective because if the idea is to think about, okay, what to do differently? How could I make my journey a little bit more efficient? Right? Well, let's say instead of taking two years, could I, could I have it done in nine months? Um, so then I could probably say things like, I would have never accepted the uh, the lead architect role. I would never get COVID. I would never go for the wedding. I would never change companies. Right? But I don't regret those things. Right? Those are just like things that I made a decision for those. And I still own the decision. I, I, I feel like it was the right decision. Right. So from that perspective, I don't regret it. But from psychological perspective, I think uh, I now knowing... Uh, how I felt throughout the journey and what I was experiencing. I, I think I could have uh, made a little bit less changes on myself. Like for example, when when I went for the evaluation board, um, I remember feeling uh, really, really stressed. Like I, I had a big uh, fear of failure because I knew about the consequence. I knew that if I fell at that time, it means I have to wait for another six months, right? And, and mentally, I was just like not prepared to wait another six months uh, because I felt like I would completely lose momentum. It actually happened to uh, one of my study buddy from probably he he failed at evaluation board and he never completed the journey, right? So I was um, very conscious of that, and uh, unfortunately, like yeah, I I couldn't relax myself into that, but. I was lucky enough to to actually pass, but uh, yeah, that that took a, quite a bit of toll. And then another thing that I would have probably done differently is that I actually really really enjoyed the the study groups and the uh, the daily um, study discussions. Uh, that was something I really cherished. But then uh, when I had to do the mocks, it always took quite a bit of toll on me, especially in the in the early days, because uh, you know. It takes a lot of effort just to solve the, the scenario and then to present it, do the Q&A, then take the feedback and then just like even reflect on the feedback. It was, it took a lot of energy. And because at the, at the beginning, I had a little bit of a perfectionist mind. Like I was always trying to uh, do all the details and not really paying enough attention to the time management. I was oftentimes going over time. Um, which uh, I think it was not necessarily the right strategy. Now, like thinking back, uh, the time management uh, element was always a challenge for me till the very end. And I should have probably accepted the importance of the time management and uh, drop some of the details uh, in, in my solutioning and in my overall approach sooner. I, I would have made mm -hmm. it less changes for myself, yeah. And obviously, um, your, your goal lasted, and, and you know, there, there are people out there for sure that have had like longer periods because they, they might not have, you know, ticked things off along the way. Like they might have the goal of the CTA, but they're not striving towards it daily like you were. Um, but then you all, all of a sudden, you get that email, you're walking along the river, you, you've passed. How, how important was it for you then to have some like downtime and not to set yourself another crazy goal um, soon after? Or did you feel it was important to then, you know, have something else to strive towards once you take that one off? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the most important thing that I felt was to actually give myself some rest and uh, to give myself some reward. So I've already been for two vacations, um, one in uh, Canary Islands, one in Sicily. And uh, really, uh, the, the priorities have changed temporarily because I... During my studies, uh, I kind of reduced my uh, social interactions quite a bit, uh, not seeing friends and family as often as I would have liked. So I knew I had quite a lot to make up for and definitely to make up for my son and my family. Um, so definitely I, I was not immediately thinking of uh, some, some crazy goals straight away. I, I needed just to switch off and, and recover. Yeah. Mm. And anything since, like, has anything started creeping in now around what, what you might want to do next? Yeah, so in terms of the future goals, uh, so uh, I think, uh, so, yeah, I talk about uh, the, the uh, sort of family side of things. So uh, I mentioned my holiday in, in um, Sicily. I, I actually proposed there uh, so to, to my fiance, and uh, she said yes. So I think that is going to be... 
some planning of a big event, uh, organizing the wedding. That's one. Um, I also have a big 40 coming up uh, this summer. So we'll be uh, celebrating with my best friend. Uh, it's going to be uh, quite a big event. So that's from, from the social side of things and family side of things. Then I feel like I also neglected my fitness a little bit, right? Uh, over, over the time was I was preparing. So now I set myself a goal. Uh, I actually signed up for my first triathlon in, uh, in Oxford in July. And I already started to train for that. Uh, so, um, yeah, you may take it. This is a potentially quite a big thing. Um, and then uh, from career perspective, uh, I I don't know exactly uh, yet, but I, I'll take the summer to think about it. Uh, what's what's next? But uh, at the moment, I'm in a, in a role which is half uh, focused on pre-sales and half focused on delivery and implementation. So I think... For the time being, um, in quite a good spot, but maybe going forward, I may try something more to do with enterprise architecture, or complex system architecture, or even maybe management roles. I will, I will see what uh, what comes next. And then, yeah, uh, awesome. then from skills perspective, uh, I actually already started to do search again. Uh, so just recently, I did the um, health cloud and uh, consumer goods cloud uh, accredited professional. And I'm yeah focusing on industries uh, at the moment. Uh, I want to do the public sector solutions um, cloud as well, and Microsoft too. Uh, so yeah, that's from skills perspective. And uh, I also want to give back to to, to the community. Uh, so hopefully present at uh, some conferences or potentially start writing on blog or doing more podcasts like uh, like this one. Yeah, nice. Well, it seems like you've got another couple of busy years to dive into. And uh, obviously your fiancé has seen you at your your peak in terms of planning and uh, throwing yourself into a challenge. So you're probably going to have a lot of work to do with the, the wedding planning as well. Well, I actually said that uh, that I, I'm not organizing that one. But uh, if, uh, <laughs> if it needs to be, we may build a solution on Salesforce. Uh, <laughs> something like that, just, just for the giggles. Yeah, nice. Well, look, look, thanks so much. I've I've really enjoyed hearing the story and um and and your journey and and there's some really important messages in there. So I hope a lot of people get some value from from what you've said as well and take some of the the mental health and um you know the the self help um and and like looking after yourself through the journey um angle. It's important, right? People need to take note of that. Um and uh, and yeah, if anyone does want to reach out and pick your brains or ask any questions about your journey or or, or anything really that's been discussed today, where's the best place to find you? Yeah, LinkedIn is definitely the one where I'm active. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure being here. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the chat. And if you did, please make sure you have subscribed for future episodes that are coming through. I would also be very grateful if you would consider leaving a review on your chosen podcast platform as five-star reviews will help us to reach more trailblazers from across the world. I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon, and thanks again.